losing all hope And your heart cannot take Any more of these broken mistakes Oh, 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 oh. hold on and be fair To be safe when you lose all your pride Oh, 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 oh. let go, oh, oh, oh. You're starting again with me by your side What is up? Crazy weekend. Not crazy if you didn't have a leverage. If you had leverage, you got your ass kicked. But I know you guys are smarter than that. I know no one here had undue leverage because you're smart. Jerry and I were going back and forth uh, Friday about this. We were chatting about this. Um, what is going on, everybody? So let's say hello. I will real quick comment. So kind of an interesting party I went to um, Saturday night. So my buddy probably can't say his name, and I can't say his name either. So there's two people I can't say their name. But anyway, my buddies are, are um, both on the production side and in the in front of the camera side in the Hollywood dish stuff. Anyway, we had a party over at my buddy's house, which is the most ridiculous house you've ever seen. It's it's I don't know somewhere between fourteen and twenty thousand square feet. That's the house, not the lot. <laughs> That's just the house. And then there's like three different swimming pools. Anyway, stupid. But so we went over to we had a party. It was really cool, and it was a UFC watching party, and the UFC had a film crew there, and they were watching us watch the fights because uh, it was a cross promotion with Mortal Kombat and we had um, the people the the people from Mortal Kombat at the house to watch the fights so that was a lot of fun so we got to all like kind of jump in there and you know get into all that and there was there was all sorts of crazy stuff the more alcohol was going I don't drink but everybody else around me seems to drink a lot and so it was a lot of interesting things said, some uh, some wagers made, some uh, some challenges, some gauntlets thrown down. And anybody that watched the UFC, it was pretty crazy. I mean, just broken legs and just the most crazy knockout. Anyway, it was a lot of fun. So it was fun watching the UFC with Mortal Kombat. So, and got to do the plug. You don't go to Mortal Kombat for the script. You don't go to hear prose. You're not going to have any sonnets or soliloquies. You're just going to see a bunch of people get their asses kicked. Their spines ripped out. It's visually awesome. Um, the fight sequences are really well done. Phil Tan um, choreographed a lot of this stuff. And Phil and I go way back. It's like a very, it's a strange small world. But anyway, Phil and I, and my buddy Shannon, who's been on the show, he goes way back. Um, so the fighting is amazing, and the spectacle is amazing. And if you grew up on Mortal Kombat video games, you'd love it. Is are you? Is it going to be? Is it going to be nominated for an Oscar? It's unlikely. It's unlikely. However, it had the best opening of any film other than King Kong, um, and they didn't open in China. They didn't. There's a lot of parts of Europe they didn't open. So they, they crushed the opening given, you know, what they had to kind of open with. So that's cool. So there's my plug. Go see Mortal Kombat. Um, go watch my buddy Lewis and go watch, you know, all the fights are choreographed by my buddy Phil. So that's amazing. And they're really great. It's, you can't ask for a cooler group of people that are very humble. They're not uh, Hollywood douchebags. So it's hard not to get behind those guys. And there was a bunch of other cool people there, but I can't. I'm not I can't say people's names because I'm not sure what the rules are with all that. Okay. Let me say hello to Scorpion, Gordon Bennett, Get Involved, Real J. Cole, of course, Hedino 3, SGO Theta TV, Belinda Cook, Fake Keeper. Antonio, what's going on? Joe Pirate, Video Tuber. But about Chelsea. What's going on, Chelsea? Cece Brown, Solid Gold, Stress Relief. Ocean Dawn. Seb Sebi Seb. Sebi Seb. Philippe Trading. And where did WVS 2014? Zorn. Cool. So everybody on Theta, hello. We've been so 
if you're on Theta, I don't know how you share it, but see if you can share it. Let's try. We really want to build up our Theta following. I think it's cool that people get paid to watch, to learn about the cryptos. Uh, did another show this morning for um, Money Map Press. More news to come there, but basically the team, the team from Raging Bull is now there. So if you were looking for Raging Bull content, look up Money Map Press. Money Map Press. There's the plug, even though it's not really plug. There'll be more coming on that. Um, I'll just I'll know more tomorrow for for you. Also, tomorrow is it's it's going to be an irregular show. Tomorrow is going to be it's going to I think we're going to call it crypto and coffee making sense with Emil Kalinowski and Jeffrey Snyder. Uh, it's going to be wicked for those of you. So everybody always asks Jeff about the fed. They ask Jeff about all sorts of various minutia of detail, but Jeff was one of the first guys to follow crypto back in 2013. He was already looking at Bitcoin and written several papers about it. So we're going to be talking macro crypto Euro dollar digital dollar and all things in between. And I promise you, what you will hear with us, with Jeff, with Emil, it will be different than what you hear if you go check him out on CNBC or Bloomberg or Real Vision or if he testifies in front of Congress. So it'll be a lot of fun. Okay. Um, let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Let me say hello to Brady, of course, in the house. Scorpion, Joe Fernandez. Kionda. Let's see. We got Emmanuel. What up, Emmanuel? JJ, Patsy Green, Phil Moore. Manuel and I were going back and forth all weekend, uh, just kind of digging into the details of this Biden tax plan sell-off. Real quick, that's not what this was. You guys realize that, right? All these idiots are writing these articles. The Biden tax plan, did, did anything change on the tax plan uh, last night? Anyone? Did Biden go back on it Sunday night? Did he send out a tweet? No. These idiots keep writing. They keep writing the same dumb articles. The sell-off led by the Biden tax plan. It wasn't led by the Biden tax plan. If you guys look, and I, I can pull up, take me, take what I'm saying and just and just put it in the back of your mind. Leverage is what unwound this market. It started two and a half days before the Biden Biden tax plan, the tidal wave of chaos. It had nothing to do with that. It may have been exacerbated a little bit, but people that are in the traditional space and the traditional financial space they're not this, these are not the people that will or won't enter crypto based on something biden said and the people in crypto they don't really give a crap so th this isn't a formed market yet this isn't a market that trades on that kind of typical news the only thing you might see is a little bleed over where maybe some new money some new big money might say let's push pause and let's get kind of let's get an idea of what this tax plan looks like we're going to talk about the tax plan a little bit. We're going to talk about a few things today. We're going to go into into detail about what rehypothecation or recollateralization really is because a lot of you're hearing this. This is another cool word that all the crypto idiots are throwing around like they know what the F they're talking about. They do not know what the F they're talking about. There's a lot of idiots, man. Be, please try to steer clear of the idiots. There's so many. It's tough. If you spin around in a direction and throw a rock, you will hit an idiot. And he will tell you how to trade. And I would urge you not to do that. Do your own research. Don't trust anybody you hear online or otherwise. Just ask yourself a bunch of questions. Okay. Let's continue. Phil, don't drive into oncoming traffic, please. Thank you. Jimmy James, Ella Paul, what up? Wolverine, Maniac, what HK? What's going on, Scott? Sunil, Candace. Hello, Candace. Michael, across the pond. Voitech, what up, buddy? Let's see. Do you think about Polygon? Yeah, I think it's a lot of FOMO. So is Solana right now. So you wait for these things to cool down. It's the same thing with um, with ThorChain and Rune. It popped way up. You let it come back down. Then you start building your position. Solana probably has a great future, but it's a little steamy, a little frothy. And, you know, the whole thing, remember, they launched an asset called Step, and it went from a nickel to like nine bucks and 35 cents in, a, in just a few minutes. And then, of course, it sold back down, but it's still around six bucks. And what is this? This is just – this is a frothy, hypey, 
everything new. Let's buy it as much as you can and flip it. So this is just a very – it's a truncated IPO market. It's a lot of hype, but it, but in there is a good asset. I just don't think you get it now. I think you wait and you let – kind of let the market come to you, right? Don't go and force trades. And if you want, if you're going to – if you just feel like I got to buy Solana today, then you go buy – a quarter or a fifth of the position you would have built. Anyway, Jerry, what's going on? Good to see you, Big Jer. Nubia, Patsy Green, Ashley and Dave, what's going on? Al Greco in the house. King Cardano, welcome back. Probably going to have a pretty good week, wouldn't you say, King? <laughs> it could be a good week for the ADA community. It's a good week anyway, no matter what the price action is, because the, there's kind of only one first time. And this is definitely a first time. This is the first real use case of cryptocurrency other than Bitcoin. So that happens, or at least the official announcement, it looks like, happens on Thursday. It's all but done. We've seen the pictures. We've seen Charles and – yeah, it's coming. Okay, Liquid Smoke Jr., what's going on? Um, yeah, we're doing another screening of Mortal Kombat actually this weekend with the cast and crew again. So that's going to be kind of fun. Turns out they like my buddy's <laughs> his private theater in his house on the on the second of one, two, three, four of the second of four floors. No, it's the second level, but it's the first floor. No, crap. I don't know where it is in the building. Somewhere low in the building where the cigar room and all that kind of stuff is. It seats like 45 to 50 people. It's a full stage. It's I don't know. It's. It, it's the most ridiculous thing. Anyway, um, so we're going to go see – I think Friday or Saturday we're going to go watch uh, Mortal Kombat with Mortal Kombat. That will be kind of fun. All right. Uh, Fish and Magician, what's going on? Jeffrey, good to see you. Frank, Sylvia. Uh, but, uh, but Leon, what's up, Leon? Welcome back, buddy. Hits NDC, Bernard, Hoop and Tony, Tom, the Caves, Tony. Did I say Tony twice? You know what? You're great, Tony. You get twice. You get two ends. You get two recognitions. Uh, Rocky's in the house. This is paralysis. What's going on? Okay, we're almost there. Dubai money. Adam. Josiah. Any thoughts on ZRX? Uh, I don't have any thoughts on that. Chris Parsons. And I think we got it. Kevin Broadway. Spirella. Uh, about Cyberboss. Crypto Gamer 420. Mark. Good to see you. 29 LH 06 BP Brother. Marclando, get involved. Oh, someone was asking. Yeah, we're gonna go. We're gonna go pick up a Lambo today. We're going to get a spider. Well, that's not completely true. We're going to start negotiating. These things take days. Um, so yeah, so that's gonna be the newest one we add to the fleet. We got rid of a hardtop um, Huracan, and we're gonna be. We got a. We got rid of a twenty. We're bringing on a twenty-one spider. So should rent quite well in the LAs. Uh, and hey, if you have two thousand dollars you want to spend for one day, come and rent one of our Lambos. <laughs> Don't do that. Invest. Don't ever rent one of our cars. Don't rent carp, man. Don't rent exotics. Well, don't buy exotics. But don't don't spend money on stupid stuff. Um, Brandon, what's going on? Good to see you. Good to see you. Solana uh, tokens are plummeting. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, we will be right back, and then we will start the show. We're going to talk about rehypothecation. That's kind of our first order business, but we'll cover some little basic quick news, uh, and then we'll go from there. See you in a few. So let's get it started. Um, that's actually a good question. This paralysis asks, what about Cody? Should we keep an eye on it Thursday? Uh, I don't think Thursday. I think I think people start front-running this. Matter of fact, I think people have started front-running this, and I think a little bit of it is front-runned. Front-run-front-runned. 
<laughs> oh, words. Um, I think I think a little bit of the price action is already kind of baked in, but I don't think I think everyone still goes, yeah, we'll see. Yeah, we'll see. There's yeah, Cody's a big deal too. Mm, that's a good way to skin it. It's a good way to skin it. I thought about going, I thought about building a pretty good size position in Cody. I've just been watching it. Anyway, if so, yes, it's on the table, but I don't think Thursday specifically. I think people that are going to game. Okay, let me say this. If you're trying to game the price of, of ADA, it's it's a long play. You either are gaming it and probably go in now and or have gone in when it dipped to 106 over the weekend when everything dipped, when everything took a bath because of leverage, because of you know idiots panicking on the weekend when there was no one to talk to. And then as the price comes back up, as things always do, um, and I actually thought we were going to have a deeper, deeper chaos. So Emmanuel and I were going back and forth on this. I thought, I think I expressed my thoughts Friday that I thought we were going to have a deeper chaos over the weekend. And I thought a lot of, a lot of margin calls were going to go. Why? Because Mashinsky said, and he tweeted, hey guys, maybe put some extra, you know, collateral on the exchange to avoid margin calls, meaning they knew they were going to margin call a lot of people. I would be really interested to see how many people got evacuated. Plus, imagine this. When the price got down below 49, imagine how many people woke up Sunday. No, woke up today and they go and they log into their Celsius account and they got force stabilized. And then the price came back up to 53, almost 54K. Oh, <laughs> oh. Don't take on leverage. You don't need it. You don't need it. Okay. Um, Scott Hill, good to see you. Jeffrey, also good to see you. Uh, let's see. Always miss beginning. Do you have a stable hour and day for the show? Yes. It's 8.30 a.m. Pacific time. And so that's pretty much been the norm. But you can always catch it again. Go to my Twitter. Nicholas Black 60. It's always in the Twitter feed. So anybody that misses a show, go to Twitter. And just click on it. It's the it's going to be the most recent tweet. I don't tweet much unless it's crap talking these stupid NFTs that are getting launched on Cardano. You know I love me some Cardano, but the NFTs being launched on it are stupid. Stupid. They're dumb. Anyway, it's cool that you can do that, but we shouldn't be doing that. It's just gums up uh, an elegant network. Okay. Um, so, yeah, 8.30 a.m. And I will let you guys know if any of that changes. It may or may not change. Uh, I'll know this week because I'm, we're talking to those people. We have our big meeting tomorrow. <laughs> so the big meeting is tomorrow right after, um, crypto and coffee and making sense with Emil Kalinowski and Jeffrey Snyder. Bam. Oh, by the way, for those of you that were waiting for the George Gammon interview that was supposed to be tomorrow, George Gammon's people had to call and cancel. Uh, apparently he's got something else on his plate you guys know he's been dodging me for a long time he has continued to dodge and i think the idea of a live venue is not something that george gammon is interested in and it's not fair to say that he's been dodging me it's been his secretary okay george you're i guess george you're too fancy for us okay george is too fancy it is what it is blue what's going on Making, making, that's cool. Making, making crypto and coffee and sense. Yeah, but see, I got to keep the making sense. Crypto and coffee always makes crypto and coffee. Oh, it's, uh, we're close, but we have to keep their name. We have to keep the purity. <laughs> Can I come on the show? Oh God. Yes. There's so many bad ones. They're so bad. Don't buy these, these NFTs. I'm going to have you on Rocky. They're so bad. Anyway, uh, okay, so we're going to talk about a few things. Let's see what's going on. So right now, Polygon, Matic, um, is understandably in the buying zone. Now, listen, I'm not telling anyone to do anything. I'm saying, and I'm not going to act on this one because I want to wait and see the dust settle from the weekend. I did act yesterday. I bought a not insignificant chunk of both AGI and um, – Rune, so Thor chain. So I told you I'm building that position. So on Friday, when things started to drop, I bought Fetch. Um, I actually took some profit in Engine 
This is, matter of fact, this is exactly what I did. I took some profit in engine because I was up like a 15x. And I was like, okay, we're going to take a little off the table. I took a little off the table and I waited and I kind of dollar cost average. So I bought fetch and then I dollar cost average into both rune and AGI. I'm continuing to build my AGI position. I'm going to keep buying AGI to a buck. I'm going to keep buying rune to 15. Um, I'm going to keep buying fetch to a buck. I That's my big play. I might fall on my face, but I'm not going to not have AI exposure when I believe that's the, where the whole human thing, the whole experiment's going. Okay. Polygon, Matic, looking very good. It's up 32% today. Yes, it's pretty much crushing everything else, even, even with the bounce back. Um, so what are the movers? Well, you can see them here. Now, when when the Vortex scores, this is ProCoin Telegraph, the theory is above 90, you buy it, and you, you go, the time-based strategy seems to work the best for me, and it's usually good, usually, for about 20%, 28%. And that is you hold it for 168 hours, one week. What you might also do is the minute you're 20% in the profit or 25%, go ahead and add a trailing stop and then just and kind of fire and forget. Um, so let's take a look at, so how would you, how would you do this response? It's from the moment it went into the nineties. So it touched its vortex score of 90 right here at about 4 a.m. UTC time. So few several a few hours ago is when it popped into that 92 score. So that's where you so basically you go a week. You should be exiting this trade. Your you should be exiting your original investment if, and I'm not telling you to do this, I'm just saying if you were going by their kind of system, you would be exiting this trade Sunday night, Monday morning, really early. Cool. Okay. Kind of fun, right? Um, I'm not a trader, and I I did make some trades for about a month, month and a half. I'm more used. I'm more interested in this as just an information gathering platform. So there you go. Uh, and then you can look at the bottom ones. And and of course, you know, again, everything's going to be going up today. That doesn't mean it's time to buy. It doesn't mean it's time to sell. Just if you're an investor, you don't really care. It's just interesting to watch the action. Okay. Um, the movers, Serum Harmony, Polygon, Polygon, uh, Phantom, and I Exec RLC. Mm, <laughs> same sketch. Um, Twitter volume, Serum Polygon, Nexus Mutual. They have another. I think they have another product they're going to put out for Polkadot and another asset. Anyway, their uh, insurance. It's. I'm not a big fan of Nexus. Uh, I've seen some scammy behavior in and around it, but it is what it is. Solana. Everybody's excited about it. Twitter volume way up. Uh, wax, the wax. Uh, why is wax interesting? Wax, if you guys remember when we were talking about the non-fungible tokens that Tops did, the Major League Baseball release that me and Alex completely doge, doged into, uh, we bought a lot of cards. But we're doing really good on those cards. There's only one first set. You're still not too late. Most people are not uh, – hip to this but you have to go to kucoin and buy wax transfer it create a wax wallet once you have a wax wallet then you can buy these assets uh atomic is probably the best place to buy them and again there's only a first series one there's only one series one and then after that it's like all the others and so look at look at how much skrilla all the people from nba top shots gathered the pro the difference is with wax you can actually take your profits and exit transfer back into any other asset, stablecoin or otherwise. With NBA Top Shots, your money's landlocked on those exchanges. You can't get your currency units out. It's just, there's people that are paper rich. They can't get out. I like rich rich. I'm a big fan of rich rich. Paper rich, not so much. All right, trading volume, Serum, Polygon, Solana, Terra, uh, iExec, RLC. Okay, cool. Um, interestingly, that is it. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about, and let me just make sure, uh, what platform you're using to buy. Uh, I buy Fetch. Okay, you can get both Fetch and AGI at KuCoin, K-U-C-O-I-N. Do Again, whenever you're signing up for an exchange account, do all of your due diligence. Go look at the exchange. Go look at the feedback. Go look at the reviews. When you do finally decide to sign up, make sure 
that what you're writing is exactly the right letters for the exchange. I, I like to go to Google, look at the website, make sure it's the real one, go from there, go into my you know, browser and write it. Um, there are – people are pulling all sorts of shenanigans right now, so just be very careful. Okay, so yeah, KuCoin for Fetch and AGI. You can also get Fetch over at Gate. You can – Transfer both of these through MetaMask. You can stake both of these. The staking for AGI, it's it's a new monthly staking contract each month. However, for the next three months, if you do it, you will also get the DAO governance token, Singularity DAO. If you, I think it's going to be worth a mint. Man, don't get on the wrong side of Sophia. You get crushed. And then fetch, uh, stake it at fetch.ai. And and if you stake it, you will, not only will you get fetch. And yes, I know it costs you some Ethereum to get it done. It's frustrating, but it is what it is. But you will also get Atomics. As part of the Phoenix program, you get these other tokens. You get Atomics and you get Metal X. It's crazy. So that's kind of cool. Um, good. Okay. I guess we've got that nailed. Um, let me see. Um, you can purchase Wax directly from the Wax wallet. Yes, I'm just not stress relief. You're right. I just don't like going credit card to you lose a lot in that transaction so it's whatever it's whatever you want to do do whatever's easiest for you so you don't make mistakes okay um patrick what's going on would you buy governance coins straight up or just as rewards oh i would buy them straight up because look at the price performance of governance tokens in platforms that have a lot of you know kind of eyeballs on them um they do really well Governance tokens do really well. So, yeah. Uh, Aaron, what's going on? And Kate the Great in the house. Ivy Medusa. Yeesh. Is MetaMask legit? Yes. It is legit. Uh, and, yeah, you can use Trust Wallet. I I just I, – I use MetaMask. I actually have a bunch of wallets. Um, use whatever is the most comfortable to you. The cool thing with MetaMask is you're just using it as a mediator to sign transactions. Um, like anything, you got to be careful with the software you use. So if you don't like it, don't use it. General Kaizen, what's going on? Okay, let's switch gears. Everybody sit back. Relax. It's education time. We're going to talk rehypothecation because you hear it all the time. And I, and I read this article last night. I thought, you know what? This is a good article that goes through what is rehypothecation or recollateralization. Um how it works, an ex a, a few examples, how it can go wrong and how it can really, really go wrong. And then if you listen to episode C, so there's A, B, and C of Making Sense with Emil Kalinowski and Jeff Snyder. No. B and C. They talk about all of the rehypothecation that is occurring and the danger of quantitative easing in that the Fed goes in and strips out quality collateral. But in doing that, they're essentially forcing the broker dealers to do more recollateralization or more rehypothecation of collateral. And that's why we have collateral problems or there are at least structural risks, these huge risks because of this rehypothecation. And, and, and when you hear about it, you'll say, well, that's that seems really scammy. It seems incredibly scammy, especially for any of you who are dealing with exchanges, traditional legacy exchanges, and you have a margin account. Did you know that if that exchange has problems, they can take all of your assets, not just your margin? Even if you're not using margin, they can take everything. E-Trade can take everything. Fidelity, everything. Waterhouse, everything. Morgan Stanley, everything. TD Amer, you see where I'm going? Do you want me to continue? Everything, if you have a margin account in the equity space, shut it down. I mean, literally shut it down. It's not enough just to not use margin. You need to shut your margin account down. You need to call them and you need to say, turn off my margin account. I want a regular cash account. You say, that seems like a lot of trouble. <laughs> Maybe by the end of this, you won't think so. So this is just a... Sit back and relax episode for now. So for about the next 15 minutes, I'm going to teach you guys what rehypothecation really actually is. And then really quick, uh, Josiah, uh, he says, Anchor USD, does anyone use it? I don't use Anchor USD. 
Um, is Celsius a better option? I don't think Celsius is ever a better option. But, um, but that's just because I'm not super comfortable about Celsius and the team and and the, some of the claims that they make. That's all. Um, yeah. Anyway, that's a long discussion. Don't worry. I won't. Uh, I won't attack. All right, Tiffany. Also good to see you. Uh, so Tiffany Patrick, hello. Cool. Is it res- is it related to fractional reserve banking? Well, no. This is it's 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 similar in in mindset, but this is the repledging of collateral. All right, let's get into it because this is a really interesting subject, and it should. Ooh, you know what we need? We definitely need intrigue music for this. The more you understand this, and then the more your brain starts to connect it to what's actually happening in the legacy financial system, the more uncomfortable uncomfortable you will be, and the more outraged you will be that quantitative easing is still even a thing. You just go, how can these idiots, they're idiots, man. It doesn't make any sense. They're really intelligent idiots. Let's go. All right. Oh, wait, no, 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 no. We want, we want, give me a second. Let me go. We want suspense. Okay. What is rehypothecation? <clears throat> By Joshua Ken. Rehypothecation is the reuse of collateral from one lending transaction to finance additional loans. It creates a type of financial derivative. This is where we get greasy and can be dangerous if abused. Rehypothecation is among the obscure investing topics, one that many investors and traders don't encounter in day to day conversations. However, changes in regulations around its use could lead to devastating consequences under the wrong circumstances. Hmm. <laughs> Investors, traders, and others need an understanding of rehypothecation, the risks it poses, and the way to protect their assets. And I'm going to tell you right now, if you don't have time to tune into the rest of this, shut down your fucking margin accounts on any legacy financial system. If you have any margin accounts anywhere, shut them down. Don't just, don't, don't just not use it. Shut it down because it gives them access to your entire account in the event that they have a liquidity crisis. You say, well, how can they take my money? They can take every goddamn nickel, all of it. They don't owe you shit. They're in trouble. And I'll continue. What is what is hypothecation? Think collateralization. Okay. Before you can understand rehypothecation, you have to understand hypothecation, which refers to taking certain assets and pledging them as collateral for it for a debt collateral that can be seized in the event of a default them demons in the details seized in the event of a default it doesn't have to be your default is the thing this is quite common in lending for example if you buy a home and take out a mortgage you're entering into a hypothecation agreement because while you retain the title to the house failure to pay the mortgage can result in the bank or the lender seizing it Note, different types of hypothecation agreements are regulated in different ways. In the United States, it's generally easier to seize a car than it is a home. That's, uh, I think, part of the Homestead Act. Don't quote me. And don't matter of fact, don't ever quote me. You'll probably get kicked out of wherever you're at. What is rehypothecation? Rehypothecation then is what happens when a lender takes the collateral from that original loan. So this is the lender. Okay, They gave you money. They took your collateral. They use that collateral for a new debt. So wait, what? This new debt is now a derivative financial product based on the original debt agreement between you and your lender. Okay, you buy, sign the agreement to buy the house. You give them a down payment. They take the note or whatever. They can then repledge that. That becomes a piece of paper that they can borrow against, and they can do all sorts of things with that money. Meaning your collateral now became someone else's collateral. The process increases liquidity in the market while also increasing uncertainty. And I would say that it it increases fake liquidity because two people now own one asset. What's the saying? One, uh, One cannot ride two horses with one ass. I'm sure that's, that's probably Shakespeare. The more assets are used or reused in this way, the less clear it is who owns the asset and who has rights to payment if someone in the chain defaults, okay? So 
alternative name would be collateral reuse. So rehypothecation or re-collateralization. And you start to say, well, that sounds, that sounds sketchy. Oh, it's incredibly sketchy. <clears throat> Let me continue the sketchiness. How rehypothecation works. Let's say you borrow money and hand over the collateral. The original lender then turns around and borrows them uh, and borrows money, repledging your collateral. So the lender that you just borrowed money from that took your collateral, they didn't lend it. Um, they use that to themselves borrow, right? Your lender no longer enjoys ultimate control over the collateral, uh, which <clears throat> and what can be done with it. Their lender now does. This is made uh, possible by something known as the Federal Reserve Board Regulation T. If any of you have ever gotten a Reg T violation for using margin the wrong way, I have. Uh, it's pretty cool. Um, you get like a piece of paper and so you got a Reg T violation. I was like, I'm framing this. Anyway, uh, it's 12 CFR uh, subsection uh, 220 Code of Federal Regulations, Title 12, Chapter 2, Sub Chapter A, Part 220, Credit by Brokers and Dealers. And this is why it comes under like uh, if you get a Reg T violation has to do with using money that technically you don't have. Even though it's a winning trade, you can you can still – anyway, it's a long story. Anyway, I digress. The arrangement can result in substantial problems if things go wrong, especially because of something known as regulatory arbitrage. In such a case, a brokerage house plays by the rules of the United States or the United Kingdom and can effectively remove any or all limits to a number of re-hypothecated or re-collateralized assets to which it has access in order to borrow money and fund its own bets on stocks, bonds, commodities, options, derivatives, meaning they can take your collateral or your cash in a collateral account or a margin account. They can pledge it, borrow against it, and gamble, and it's fucking legal. <laughs> These dudes, man. And then, and then they're like, what happened? Why did we get beat up? Why did we lose? You deserve to lose everything. This is, again, part of the fat, rich, white, scam everyone game. That's why I'm not 100% against the Biden tax plan. Rich people got real, real rich the last 17 months on your backs, on your necks, by stepping on your necks, by, by basically stealing stimulus funds at nine out of every $10. Honestly, man, F those dudes. They, they know exactly what they're doing. They got you. They just took you to the woodshed. They've always taken you to the woodshed. And now they got to pay a little extra rent. OFW. All right. An example of rehypothecation. Imagine you have $100,000 worth of Coca Cola shares parked in a brokerage account. You've opted for a margin account, which we all know we're not going to do, right? Meaning you can borrow against your stock if you desire, either to make a withdrawal without having to share, share ah, sell shares or to purchase additional investments. Usually it means people just want to take risk. Um, margin requirements in the United States, I believe, are you have to have $25,000 in your account to qualify for margin account that gives you $100,000 in margin exposure. All right. You decide you want to buy $100,000 worth of Procter & Gamble on top of your Coke shares and figure you'll be able to come up with the money over the next three or four months paying off the margin debt that is created. <clears throat> You put in the trade order, and your account now consists of two hundred thousand dollars in assets. Right? You had a hundred thousand in Coke, and the hundred thousand you essentially borrowed from your account, uh, from your margin account, and you put it in Procter and Gamble. Right? With a hundred thousand dollar margin debt owed to the broker, so you owe the broker a hundred grand, but you have a hundred grand in P and G stock. You pay interest on the margin loan, right, on the hundred Gs, in accordance with the account agreement governing your account, and you know whatever margin rates are in effect. Okay, your brokerage firm. <clears throat> <laughs> Here's where it gets crazy. Your brokerage firm has to come up with the hundred grand in case you wanted to borrow in order to settle the trade when you bought the PNG, right? So you have a margin account, you want to buy PNG. The brokerage firm is the one that has to, they have to come up with the cash. So you've pledged 100% of the assets in your account, meaning you've, you've pledged 100K of the Coke stock as your collateral against the PNG stock, right? And so basically that's, you know, your entire net worth. Great. Um, to pay back the loan because you've been given a personal guarantee. That is, you and your broker have entered into an arrangement and your shares have been hypothecated or they have been collateralized. The P&G shares are collateralized by the Coke shares. We're all on board. Great. Um, so that's the collateral for the debt you've given and it's an effectively a lien on those shares. How brokers get margin lending funds. Okay, 
In some cases, the broker might fund the trade out of their own net worth or resources. Perhaps it is conservatively capitalized and has a lot of current assets with little or no debt sitting on the balance sheet. So basically, a broker that's kind of all cash or has a lot of assets, they're going to have an easy time self-funding. However, maybe your broker issued corporate bonds uh, knowing that it can earn a spread between the interest rate that it charges between its clients and what it costs them to sell the debt. Regardless of how the broker funds the loan, there's a good chance that at some point it will need some working capital in excess of what its book value alone is, right? If, if they, if your broker has all assets and no cash, at some point they're going to have to tap in there, take some of those assets and repledge them to grab a little working cash, right? They got to pay the lights, the bills, the people that work there. Uh, they got to pay off senators and congressmen. They have to pay people under the table that work at the city. There's just so much you got to pay for. All right. Uh, lawyers, right, whatever. Okay. To make paternity suits go away. All right. For example, many brokerage houses work out a deal with a clearing agent, such as the Bank of New York Mellon, to have the bank lend them money to clear transactions with the broker setting up uh, with the bank later, making the whole system more efficient, right? So BNY Mellon would say, by the way, you're, you're hearing about BNY Mellon a lot because they're coming to the crypto space. Biggest bank in the world. Yeah, no big deal. All right. To protect its depositors and shareholders, BNY Mellon, the bank, needs some collateral. They're not just going to give these brokerage houses cash just because they like them, because they high five them. No. So they say, okay, well, you need to give us some collateral. Matter of fact, 100 cents on the dollar collateral would be great. So the broker takes Procter & Gamble and the Coca-Cola shares you pledged uh, to it, and it repledges or rehypothecates them to BNY Mellon as collateral, right? So you borrowed against your Coca Cola to buy PG. Your account is now 200K, of which you owe 100 and you have 100. They take both the BNY Mellon, BNY Mellon takes both the Procter and Gamble shares and the Coca Cola shares from the broker in order to make to give them some working capital. But now BNY Mellon has your stock, right? The broker doesn't have any more. They, they, it's, it's been re-collateralized or re-hypothecated. Seizing re-hypothecated assets, this is where it gets sticky. Imagine something happens that causes the brokerage house to fail. Maybe management loads up on leverage bets, which they do a lot. This happens more often than you may think. Besides the financial institutions that actually collapsed in 2008 and 2009, there were more than a few that came close and were saved by huge equity infusions that severely diluted stakeholders, stockholders, equity holders. Yeah? Okay. Uh, one major discount broker had borrowed lots of money to invest in collateralized debt obligations, CDOs. If you guys understand the CDO market, which are these debt tranches, we won't get into that just yet. It's a mess. Okay. Anyway, they made a bunch of leveraged gambles on mortgages that uh, you know went bad uh, because they were adjustable rate mortgages and there was collateral problems. Great. It survived, uh, but not before clients defected in mass and the business had to bring in a specialist to stabilize operations through the crisis. This this happened a lot. Okay. In such a situation, the bank in New York, Mellon, BNY, or any other party to whom the assets have been repledged. So so these this collateral is now on their balance sheet. BNY Mellon, right? Um, so to in a situation, uh, BNY Mellon or any party to whom the assets have been rehypothecated will have first dibs on the collateral, right? Because it's they're the last, they're the top of the uh the at this point, the uh capital stack, we should say. This is reinforced by a series of court rulings since 2012, which put these entities' interests above the interest of clients. Yes, you heard it correctly. You are the lowest. You, you are the weakest link in the chain that is the collateral, the, the, the uh, capital stack. Just understand that. If you own equity, you own nothing. Nothing, okay? If you have equity that is in a margin account, guess what you own? Nothing. You have nothing. You have a call on nothing. They don't have to pay you. And don't think... Insurance is going to kick in either because I, I think we, it gets it gets to the insurance aspect of that later. All right. You, you better hope you get a good bankruptcy judge is all I can say. All right. These entities are going to seize. So these entities are going to seize the shares of Coca-Cola and Procter and & Gamble to repay the money that the broker, the broker borrowed. So in this case, BNY Mellon, they start selling the assets because that's what they have. If the broker goes bad and they unwind, 
then BNY Mellon goes, cool, we have this collateral, just sell it off, cover the debt. Okay, so that means you're going to log into your account one day and some, if not all of your cash, stocks, bonds, all gone. Poof. Bye. And it's legal. Yep. Uh, in such a situation, the lost assets would not be protected by SIPC insurance. You say, wait a minute. What? Yeah. You're not protected. All gone. That's it. Bye. While partial recovery may be possible through the bankruptcy courts, there are no guarantees. This process would undoubtedly take years and it could be extraordinarily stressful. So you could be paper rich, then paper poor, then actual poor. All right. From account holder to creditor. At this point, you're merely a creditor in the bankruptcy hierarchy. You have to hope that there's enough money recovered. And when these guys take all these leverage bets, how much money do you think is left over? Most of the time it's gone because they took these leverage bets. They gambled. They gambled away your money. They gam And then they gambled away money that was collateralized by your money and your, and your assets. All gone. Poof. Okay. So <clears throat> at this point, you're merely a creditor in the bankruptcy hierarchy. You have to hope that there's enough money recovered during the court cases to reimburse you. But this whole setup is perfectly legal. And, and you end up paying someone else's bills. Under the regulations of the United States, it should be possible. And this is that whole, um, you know, Title 12, uh, CFR, uh, uh, subsection 220. Uh, it's uh, Title 12, subsection 220, yeah. <clears throat> uh, so if you look up Regulation T, that's where all this stuff um, is. Just look up Reg T, and you can go through the whole list. All right. Under the regulations of the United States, it should be possible for clients with margin accounts to know that their potential exposure to a rehypothecation disaster or a recollateralization unwind is limited. For example, if you have an account with 100000 and only 10000 in margin debt to fund the, out, the outright purchase of a long equity position, you shouldn't be exposed for more than 10000 in reality, it's not always possible because certain restrictions require, requiring segregation of fully paid client assets – in in place in the U.S. following the Great Depression uh, are not in place in the U.K. So the, these rules, if you're across the pond, you need to dig into the broker-dealer rules on margin accounts because the rules are a little bit different in the U.K. And I don't know enough about the rule variations to get into that. Suffice it to say, if you have equities, if you have a 401k, if you, anything where there's margin exposure, you can get nuked. You can get your face melted right off. <clears throat> aggressive brokers uh, can, move, uh, can move money and indeed have done so through foreign affiliates, subsidiaries, and other partners and parties in a way that allowed them to effectively remove the limits on hypothecation. So because one jurisdiction might not allow you to do something, they'll simply transfer the funds to a sub, a subsidiary in another jurisdiction that will allow them to do it. So you, you have to, you want to know what you're, what your risk is. Anyway, this means it's not just the assets you borrowed against that could be seized. They can go after all of your assets. Let me read this again. This is important. You, you want to know why I like Bitcoin? You can pull that shit off the internet, put it on a hard drive and put it in your back pocket or in a safe or bury it, right? And this kind of junk can't happen. I'm going to read this paragraph again because it needs to resonate. Aggressive brokers can move money and have indeed done so through foreign affiliates, subsidiaries, and other parties in a way that allowed them to effectively remove the limits on rehypothecation. That means it's not just the assets you have borrowed against that can be seized. They can go after all of your assets. Notable happenings. You guys remember MF Global? MF Global was a, a major publicly traded financial institution and commodities broker with more than $42 billion, yeah, not a small number, in assets and nearly 3,300 employees. It was run by John Corzine, the 54th governor of New Jersey, a United States senator, and the former CEO of Goldman Sachs. Anybody surprised by what we're going to read next? <laughs> Every time you – if. Yeah. Goldman sucks is always at the end of every, if you say this big scam happened, invariably 
there are capillaries and, and veins leading back to Goldman Sachs every time. Go look at the douchiest people in, in the industry. Go look at the douchiest people in the crypto space. Go look at the douchiest humans on earth. And just keep watching. There, there will be some connection to Goldman Sachs. All right. <laughs> Beginning of the problems. In 2011, MF Global decided to take to make a speculative bet by investing $6.2 billion in its own trading account in bonds issued by the European sovereign nations, which had been hit hard by the credit crisis. The year before, right, so this is 2010, the company had reported a net worth of $1.5 billion, meaning small changes in the position would result in large fluctuations in book value. Why? Leverage. Leverage. A speculative bet means leverage. <clears throat> Combined with a type of off-balance sheet financing arrangement known as a repurchase agreement, MF Global experienced a catastrophic liquidity disaster. Wink, wink about what we hear, what we have every three weeks in crypto. <laughs> this disaster forced the company to come up with large amounts of cash to meet its collateral and other requirements. Where do you think they got that cash? Anyone? Anyone? You guys are smart. Pulling from client accounts. <sighs> Management raided the assets and client accounts, part of which included making a $175 million loan to the firm's subsidiary in the United Kingdom to pony up collateral to third parties, i.e. rehypothecation. So they just simply said, well, the law here won't allow this. We'll just push it overseas and do it where the law will allow. And then we'll just wait and see what happens. When the whole thing fell apart and the company was forced to seek bankruptcy protection, clients discovered that cash and assets in their account, money they thought belonged to them and secured by debts in which they had not defaulted, it was all gone. MF Global creditors uh, had seized them, including the rehypothecated collateral. Okay. Now, I will say this. Luckily, because there were so many big names in this fund, like big names, old family money, Rich people, fat, rich, white guys. There were so many fat, rich, white guys that were in this fund that, oh, surprise, surprise, a lot of the money was returned. Weird, right? Is Doesn't that seem democratic? Doesn't it seem like the public's best interests were served <laughs> after the chips fell? By the time uh, all was said and done, the clients of MF Global had lost $1.6 of their assets. Clients revolted suddenly uh, caring a great deal about the fine print and their account agreements and were able to get a sympathetic judge, he, who ultimately approved a settlement of the bankruptcy estate. This resulted in an initial recovery and return of 93% of customer assets. So, and again, there's a lot of demons in the footnotes. I'm not going to go into the footnotes, but this story looks a lot different when you realize that 93% of the assets doesn't mean 93% of the money you lost. Those are two different things because if the assets unwound, you could be given back a bag full of Tron and Doge, right? Where you had a bag of, you know, Bitcoin and Ethereum, right? So that's, that's not fair to say. Let's just say this. Um, they were almost made whole-ish. Many clients held out through the multi-year legal process, ended up getting 100% of their money back due in no small part to the media and political scrutiny. They were lucky. In the meantime, however, they missed one of the strongest bull run markets in the past few centuries with their money tied up in legal fights as they had. Uh, so you lose to inflation, you lose to your money being stuck, you, you lose all the way around. And this is the best case scenario that you get some of your assets back. It's the best case because there's certainly no obligation for them to give you it back. The obligation is that they attempt to. That's it. Once it's gone, it's gone. If they gamble the money away, if your uncle borrows ten thousand bucks from you for to to make to to pay his house his mortgage, and he goes and gambles it and he loses it, it's gone. I mean, it's gone, and that's it. Okay. The best way to protect yourself against rehypothecation within an ordinary brokerage account is to refuse to hypothecate your holdings in the first place. Doing that is simple. Don't open a margin account. Instead, open what's known as a cash account or in some places, a type one account. Some brokerage houses will add margin capability by default unless otherwise specified. So I would say open an options account and open a cash account. Don't open a margin account. You don't need margin. You don't need leverage. Well, I mean, I preach this a lot. Some of you think, oh, 
Everybody here was like, oh, you're too conservative, too conservative. I wasn't too conservative the last week and a half, though, was I? When Alex Mashinsky's telling everyone, be careful, you're about to get margin called. This is why. This space moves so fast. If you got called and forced stabilized over the weekend, you just lost $4,000 worth of move back up. Well, really more, 6000 It went down to forty eight. Pop back up. It's right, right around 54. You lost all that. What's 6,000 on 50? It's like 12 bordering on 13% because really on 48. You lost 13%. You got four stabilized. Cool. You're not bankrupt. But you just lost all that. All gone. Depends on how big your position was. What if you had if you had 10 Bitcoin and you got four stabilized? 10. You just lost $60,000. You just lost a Bitcoin. Poof. Bye. Anyway, just, you know, think about this stuff. So key takeaways. Rehypothecation is the reuse of previously pledged collateral, right? As the collateral for a new loan or re-collateralized. It improves liquidity in the market, which I would argue is not necessarily true. Well, at the same time, increasing the risk to everyone in the chain that touches the piece of collateral, right? Especially dumb asses like us that are at the very bottom of that chain, uh, that, that asset stack. If an asset is rehypothecated many times, by the way, by the way, brokerage houses, at least in the United States, the, uh, the prime brokers, not brokerage houses, prime brokers, broker dealers for the Fed, the 24 big banks, the minimum average rehypothecation is 8.0, meaning on average, <laughs> every dollar of collateral is rehypothecated eight times. It represents eight dollars of leverage in the system. Eight. And the whisper number is between 20 and 30. Eight is like the agreed number. So when the Fed strips the market, of quality assets like treasuries, right? Short-term, on-the-run bills. That makes these broker-dealers do more of that kind of bad rehypothecation behavior. It makes them do more of the stuff that we really don't want them to do just to stay at break-even. And, this, and so as you dig into this, you start to realize how not only how ineffective QE is, but how it is the opposite of quantitative easing, at least the way they explain it. It's incredibly deflationary. It, 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 it injects huge amounts of risk into the market. And people are just asleep at the wheel, and they're just cool with this shit. And every time Jerome Powell speaks, they're like, yeah, money printers. Bitch, there ain't no money printers going. This is the opposite. They're fucking hoovering up good quality assets and they're leaving in its wake huge amounts of, of risk. I mean, multi, multitudes, multitudes of risk, right? Exponential amounts of risk. Anyway, there you go. Um, so the best way to avoid the dangers of rehypothecation is to avoid buying margin accounts, uh, buying through margin accounts and instead only purchase through cash investment accounts. Yay. Okay, we went kind of long on that. Um, cool, man. Let's see. Destroyed my whole oh, Not impossible to go back there and start working. Yeah, I know, God. All right. Um, let's see. EE, -E, what's going on? Good. Yes, you never opened a margin account. Good on you. Good on you. I need a margin account to short. <laughs> yeah. You, you don't need a margin account to short, JJ. Um, there are other ways to do it. Um, you there, anyway, there are other ways to do it. I don't want to get into that. That's like a, we'll go down a whole other path. But yeah, um, I feel like the BTC price is going to be completely run by the paper markets in three to four years. This is true. I tend to agree with you, Ryan. I tend to agree with you. The, the only good thing we have that we know for sure is unlike the gold and silver markets, gold, uh, Bitcoin will tend to behave probably closer to the stock to flow ratio. It'll be less about these miners doing dubious stuff that we can't see at the mining level and deciding when they want to release and trying to manipulate the market. Um, we're also not beholden to miners all that much anymore, right? The amount of Bitcoin that's released every day is less than a thousand Bitcoin. And when you look at all the Bitcoin that's out there, the majority of the Bitcoin that's going to be out there is out there. There's only about 2 million left. It's kind of, we're kind of where we are. So I'm, I'm, we're not held hostage by miners, the gold and silver market, palladium, uh, ruthenium, ir iridium, um, is rhodium 
it is, I mean, those markets are, are hugely um, manipulated. But yeah, as we get more ETFs and as we get closer, you're going to have, you'll have the paper market separate from the physical. Um, I agree with that. Okay. And let's see. Uh, Alpha Horn, do any crypto exchanges allow transfer from brokerage accounts or must you transfer funds to your bank first? Most of them do. However, some of the, as a general rule, you probably want to go to your private account and from the private account to the crypto account for the simple fact that um, you, most of the crypto accounts, you have to go directly from your private account with the same name. So as long as you wire from an account with your exact same name, you, you can probably go from a brokerage directly to like a Coinbase or directly to a Kraken. Um, but it's just the account has to be the exact same name. If your name is Alfred P. Jones III and Alfred Jones sends the wire, they're going to kick it. It's got to be Alfred P. Jones III. If there's a period, it's got to be a period. Everything has to be exactly the same. And you have to set that account up with the exchange first. So you basically whitelist that account and then they can accept the incoming wire. Whew, a lot of stuff. Okay, real quick. Oh man, I was going to show you this thing on micro futures. We'll have to save it. Um, <laughs> a dumb attack on Biden's uh, plan actually reveals the weakness of GOP arguments. It's a really good article. Um, I would just say go to the Washington Post and look and just take a look at this. It just If you just uh, Google a dumb attack on Biden, this guy goes through, it's Greg Sargent. He does a really cool analysis of the Biden tax plan, more from the side of the arguments against it. And so before everybody throws their arms up like, this bull crap, they're raising taxes. It, dude, they're just going after the people that screwed you. Honestly, it's a rebalancing. The people that have perverted the market for many, many years are going to have to pay up a little bit of their extra profit. They're going to have to give a little bit more back. Good. Dude, this isn't socialism. It's fucking common sense. They don't get to steal forever. It is what it is. You don't, you don't want to pay? Keep the shit in your account. Borrow against it. There's plenty of ways you can very legally you know, weave, bob and weave around this. So for us, we should hope that we have so much money in crypto that this is a big deal. And if it is, go move to Puerto Rico and pay that much. All right. And then finally, JP Morgan, because they hate Bitcoin so much. Oh, but wait. JP Morgan may launch a Bitcoin fund this summer. Weird, right? For someone that hates crypto so much that it's all fake and scammy that they also think Bitcoin will hit 400K. Isn't it weird? You kind of wonder, well, are they talking to each other at, at JP Morgan before they get out there and, you know, do press releases? And think, I mean, I don't know. Um, will the Biden tax plan impact real estate? Well, there's there's... The obvious consequences, and then there's always these unexpected, not kind of murky consequences, right? The secondary, the tertiary, the, the, all of these effects after the initial effect. Think about like if you, you know, in pool, you make your break, the white ball hits the rest of the balls, and then phew, they all go in different directions. It's very tough to predict exactly where they're all going to go with any kind of accuracy. And that happens quite a lot. So I would say this. Um, I'm not thinking that the Biden tax, in, it, it, even if it passes, and a lot of this is just you know catering to his caucus, but because these were campaign promises, he's not doing anything. None of this is irrational or or crazy. He promised this was coming, right? So he's making good on campaign promises. So you know, good on him. I don't agree with everything he does. I, there's a lot of stuff I don't agree with because I think central planners are idiots. But at least he's following through with his promises. He promised his caucus, they elected him, and this is what you get. So good, good on him. Um, this won't affect prices, I think, as much as the big near term, I think, is this. In June and July, the free money stops. The couch money stops. The Fed money stops. Unemployment ends for almost everyone in America, right? 17 months. People have to pay rent again. People have to pay their home mortgages again. Mortgage forbearance ends, okay? People that were not paying rent have to start paying or GTFO, hit the sticks. A lot of landlords are going to use this to get rid of, to eject tenants they didn't like. 
once those tenants are gone, they can do all sorts of interesting things. So I think there's going to be a lot of evictions. There's going to be a lot of people looking for help. And even if there was another bailout coming, it's going to be months and months away. They're not even talking about anything. These things don't happen overnight. Won't they extend it? No. No, because at some point, landlords need to pay their banknotes. You can't keep telling landlords, just take, take one for the team. Take what for the team, bitch? I bought this property and you're telling everyone they don't have to pay rent? Pardon me, but F you. They can't, dude. Not, not you. I'm just saying the, the landlords can't continue to finance the tenants that are being told by the mayor and the governor don't pay rent. That's over with gone, done. Okay. So that will end. I thought there was going to be some kind of thing. There may be some kind of thing for the landlords, but again, where do you get the money from? It's a pull forward of taxes. So what do you have to do if you steal future tax? You got to raise taxes. What's the easiest one to raise? <sighs> Property taxes. So they'll just, they'll just stick them on the other end of it. it I would not, me, I would not buy a house right now. This is the frothiest market. George Gammon did a good episode, um, even though we're frenemies. George did a really good episode where he talked about the housing market. And, you know, right now it's actually higher, frothier, and more ridiculous and more overpriced than in 2006 and seven when the whole thing crashed. Did you know that? Did you know we are in the most expensive housing market in history? Does that make sense when you look around? Does the world look like it's brimming with success? Is this that growth economy that everyone promised you? Is this the best economy ever? I Last I heard for 17 months, people were coughing their lungs up. Maybe I missed it. Maybe I'm the dumb one. Come on, man. So you guys got to be careful. Don't I wouldn't buy anything. I would rent and I would rent and I would rent and I would just watch. And maybe June, July, August, maybe even though 30% of the people in the whole United States are not paying rent and who knows what the statistics are on home loans that have gone bad or are being, you know, that the banks are just kind of sitting on and flipping around and modifying the loans. So they don't have to admit that these are all foreclosures and pre foreclosures. Who knows what those numbers are? I just, I can't imagine a future where this doesn't unwind in a bad way. So my guess is June and July are not very kind in most markets. And I'm, my guess is people start front running that. The more we start talking about this, the more people are going to front run that trade. Hopefully that gets priced in, meaning hopefully the equity market gets clipped pretty considerably running into June. And then this has all been priced in and it's kind of a non-event because we expect it. And then some little headline stress. But my guess is... <laughs> Half of the people that are YOLOing, especially in crypto, half of the people that are YOLOing into the market, it's because they get 300 extra bucks a month and don't have to pay rent. No, 300 extra a week and don't have to pay rent. So take those people that are, that are like, oh yeah, I got all this free cash. I'm doing this, I'm doing that. I'm a day trader, all this kind of shit. Okay, cool. What happens in July when there's no more free money and you have to pay rent? Oh, all that's gone. The YOLO life is over. You can get your ass back to work or you'll be evicted or you're going to get evicted and still have to go back to work. Factor that in too. A bunch of people getting evicted, 30%. So one in three families getting booted, get out. You think they saved their money for the last 10, 12, 15 months? No, they've been YOLOing. They've been buying houses and TVs and this is and that's. Bitch, rent comes due now. You got to pay rent. And you don't get all this free money. So you're gonna go, it's gonna be a reverse. Everybody on average is gonna have to pay from twelve to eighteen hundred dollars more, and they're losing three thousand dollars a month. So what's the what's the flip on that? Anywhere what from forty two hundred to five thousand dollars a month the other way. So every family is gonna go from plus to from plus to negative five to six thousand dollars a month. Do the math on that and tell me that there's not a problem. <laughs> um, so my guess is it starts to get difficult for people in the 
you know, who knows, $1 million to say $3 million range to start getting finance, cash is king type situation. I think a lot of the high-end homes, you also have a whole situation where baby boomers are trying to dump their houses and there's no, bu- there's no pile of buyers because millennials haven't made it to the point where they're buying their second home. So baby boomers that, and, and remember, if the market gets crushed, the boomers get crushed because they're all, most of them are fixed income. So if they get crushed and the pensions are getting crushed, the boomers need cash. Where are they going to get it? They're only cash asset. They're only asset that's liquid ish. They're not going to be able to refi those homes. They're going to have to sell them. So what happens when the boomers put a glut of these big houses on the market and there's no buyer? Vacuum. You put more houses on the market with no buyers. How do you get more competitive? The prices have to come down. So I think it could set up a really good buyer's market. But if you're a seller, good luck, dude. Good luck. Remember, buyers are looking out the windshield. Sellers are looking in the rearview mirror. Where would you rather be? (sighs) Yeah. Your secretary says she just invested in Doge. Yeah, they brought it up today. We did an episode of Money Map of, uh, of uh, oh, what do we call the morning show? The morning, the day, think crap. I should learn that. I should learn the name of the show that we just did. Mm. It's like a, it's like an important thing. Anyway, I'm going to learn the name of that show, but it was a really good show. And she brought up Doge and, and we just, everyone ignored it. It was great. I wasn't, I was, there was like five of us on analysts. Everybody ignored it except the host like brought it up. She's like, yeah, my Doge is down. And everybody was like, <laughs> everybody's like, uh, yeah, crickets. Um, okay. Anyway, um, that's it. That's Monday. Stay out of trouble. Um, you're looking decent. You're 53.3. So listen, you're up. You're way up. Everything's – there was a couple of standouts. I was very surprised by uh, – not really surprised, but pleasantly surprised by Ethereum's resilience. Presently surprised by Cardano's resilience, but that makes sense. For those of you that don't know, this Thursday is a big deal for Cardano. I wouldn't be shorting Cardano. There is a chance that the news – since we all know what the news is, it's less than overwhelming. My guess is this thing builds – into Wednesday night. If you want to make a trade out of it, um, if you want to make a trade, which I think is silly, but if you did, I would probably be selling Cardano Wednesday night, uh, anywhere in the 130 to 150 range. My guess is we see it. We'll see. We'll see um, how much has been priced in. Uh, Polka dot back above 30. The other one that was interesting, Theta was way down. It's back up 11%. Filecoin starting to move back up. What was the big crusher? Engine's doing good. Nexo's back on top. Oh, AR Weave is crushing, dude. It's up 20%, 26 on the week. AR is crushing, dude. It got down to 19 bucks. It was 30, it was 30 bucks a few minutes ago. So anyway, that's kind of crazy. Rune got down to 11. It's back to 13. Uh, what was the other big mama? Oh, uh, there was another great. Oh, Audius. Yeah, audio. Audio was down below two dollars. Is that the buying range? Yes. Did I buy? No, I was scared. Uh, I got scared. Um, when everything was, when everything's red, I ain't buying nothing. The only thing I buy when everything's red is in the AI, in the AI space. That's the only thing I was willing to buy. So I did buy fetch. I bought fetch at 37 cents. Yes. And I bought AGI at 30.8 cents. And I thought I was getting ripped off. Just kidding. Um, so that was pretty good. That was, you know, less than 24 hours ago. Uh, wax is moving up. Cool. You need it for the tops cards. NKN's moving up, but slowly, but it's still all green and rally is moving up slowly. Uh, have a great day. Stay out of trouble. Don't do anything. My poor insolvent drunk strung out on meth. Grandmother wouldn't do. Um, she's drunk again and, and that's okay. Cause you know, it's, it's grandma. It's grandma.
black, it's time to chit chat. You know nothing about blockchain, we here to fix that. You want the news on them new stocks, this where you get that. So go and grab you a nice chair, it's time to sit back and talk to profit. Hey, hey, you talking to the profit. Hey, hey. We, talk, we talking condos and nice clothes and dropping Lambos. I remember them night codes, we couldn't stand those. We tried to drop on them house roads, but had to stay low. Now there's solutions to hard bills we couldn't pay for. I talked to profit to get some profit, we couldn't change the top. If it's a stock and I need a cop it, I wait for him to drop it. Ain't no option, let's get it popping, we chilling in the trap. I need some crypto playing in my pocket, by any means I rock. This is the profit with Nick Black, it's time to chit chat. You know nothing about blockchain, we here to fix that. You want the news on them new stocks, this where you get that. So Go and grab you a nice chair. It's time to sit back and talk to profit. Hey, hey, you talking to the profit? Hey, hey, you talking to the profit? It's all fake news. It's phony stuff. It didn't happen.